Hi, this is Titus Welliver. You're listening to TV Confidential. Good evening. I hope you'll excuse all this, but I've been taking some time off from my job to look into something important to all of us that seems to be pretty well confused. What I mean is missiles, high-performance airplanes. Why do we have so many? Why do we need both? Where are we going with all this? A fellow asked me that question in London not very long ago. You know, it's not a simple question. And I couldn't give him a simple answer, and that's the reason for all this homework. Ed Robertson with a reminder that we will play part two of our conversation with Torchy Smith later on in this hour. If you hope you stay tuned for that. In the meantime, on the line with us right now are Kevin Hamilton and Ned O'Gorman. Ned and Kevin are the co-authors of Look Out America, the secret Hollywood studio at the heart of the Cold War, the first thorough history of the most famous motion picture studio that you may not have heard of before, but which played a major role in how baby boomers and their families viewed the Cold War and the immense effects that continues to have on our political culture today. The University of Richmond describes Lookout America, the book, as a rollicking story populated by an unlikely mix of Hollywood artists, nuclear scientists, and military movers and shakers, not to mention a feat of innovative design in its lovingly crafted layout and image curation. Look at America, the book, includes hundreds of breathtaking photographs, plus easy-to-follow charts, graphs, timelines, sidebars, and screen grabs. Look at America, the secret Hollywood studio at the heart of the Cold War is available at Amazon.com, wherever books are sold online. You can more information about Lookout Mountain Laboratory, Lookout Mountain, the book, or the author's Kevin Hamilton and Ned O'Gorman, go to lookoutmountain.org, lookoutmountain.org. We mentioned how actor Reed Hadley was uh, utilized as the narrator of Operation Ivy. That's just one example of the sort of fusing between Hollywood and the government behind Lookout Mountain Laboratory. Another ambassador, another actor who was very actively involved in the Lookout Mountain projects was Jimmy Stewart. And Ned and Kevin, you both make the argument that he not only was probably one of the best ambassadors Lookout Mountain had, but they would have been better off using him more than they could. Well, uh, you know, he was already uh, an Air Force guy, so that made it a familiar face in that regard. But he was seemed to be the right figure at the right time. You know, a lot of the work he does, that Jimmy Stewart does in these films, is filming introductions. And these introductions could be for... Uh, someone, for example, who's just been assigned to a missile base, there needs to be an orientation to what's it going to be like on that missile base. How is missile defense different from bomb-based defense? And Stewart would be filmed, as you'll see in some of the films, sitting in a, a, a set, maybe look like his own study at home, just casually walking us through uh, this new technology and the new systems and educating the viewers, who, again, were largely Air Force viewers already, uh, about what they should expect. And Ned's also, I think, done a lot of good thinking and, and writing uh, about the role of Jimmy Stewart's own persona at this particular moment during Cold War history, too. Yeah, I mean, I, first of all, I just think it's an incredibly fascinating story. He, had, he has a remarkable screen presence in these films that he, he does for Lookout Mountain Laboratory. And at the same time, he's you know shooting uh, films with Alfred Hitchcock. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I think that part of what makes him such a, an important figure is that the Air Force itself is really undergoing some significant transformations in the 1950s. The Air Force grew out of air power, out of airplanes and pilots, and it was very much the whole mystique of the Air Force was built around the heroic pilot masculine figure. And in the middle of the 1950s, the Air Force became very committed to a missile program. And being a missileer is profoundly different than being a pilot and in terms of the sort of physical demands, the mental demands, and so much of what the Air Force was dealing with in terms of morale uh, in the 1950s and into the 60s was these guys who signed up to be heroic pilots and ended up sitting underground in front of a control panel waiting for an alarm to go off. And, uh, and Jimmy Stewart, just his very his body, his sort of uh, his long, lean, angular body. I think he, he he sort of represented a different kind of masculine Air Force ideal on screen that, in many ways, um, mapped more onto the missileer than to the pilot. 
And uh, I think, you know, he explicitly was advocating for the missile program on Lookout Mountain Films. And I think he was trying to, his presence was partly just about what does this new Air Force masculinity look like in an age of missiles? You mentioned that Stewart was making these films for Lookout Mountain at the time. He was continuing to do major Hollywood movies for Warner Brothers and for Alfred Hitchcock at the time. One thing I didn't know about, and this kind of goes back to something we said at the beginning of our conversation, there's actually a tie-in. You would have to know what you're looking for, but there's actually a tie-in between Rear Window and Lookout Mountain. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, indeed there is. When you uh, see in one of those opening shots, you see the pan across the mantle there. You see the different uh, photographs of of, of main characters' uh, adventures. And, yeah, right there you see a photograph of, of one of the desert atomic tests. Uh, sitting right there in view to imply that this was part of, of of the character's adventures, was documenting these as well. This is a particularly exciting topic for me. So it's not only that there, there's a Lookout Mountain photograph that is in Rear Window, but also that, you know, the character uh, is um, a photographer, right? <laughs> and uh, L.B. Jeff is, is a photographer, yeah. right? And he has been uh, photographing, we're, we're led to believe, uh, atomic tests. And so, in a, in a sense, L.B. Jeffries, the character there, is um, is perhaps a Lookout Mountain, a former Lookout Mountain employee. Who knows? But it's it's a really fascinating connection. Well, I will definitely think about that next time I see Rear Window. But in the meantime, on the line with us is Kevin Hamilton and Ned O'Gorman. They are the co-authors of Lookout America, look out, America, the secret Hollywood studio at the heart of the Cold War and a window into the Cold War from the U.S. military point of view. Look out, Mountain, the secret Hollywood studio at the heart of the Cold War, available at Amazon.com, wherever books are sold online. For more information on Look Out, Mountain Laboratory or Look Out, America, the book, go to lookoutamerica.org, look out america.org. This is a tease. I don't want you to tell the story because I want people to pick up the book to find out the story. But there's a very provocative photograph of Marilyn Monroe in the book. And there's a nice chapter that talks about Monroe's collaboration with Lookout Mountain Laboratory. The only thing I'm going to say, and again, this is a tease, the only thing I'm going to say is that it also has to do with Harold Lloyd. So if you want to find out about Marilyn Monroe and Harold Lloyd and Lookout Mountain, you've got to pick up a copy of Lookout America, the book through Amazon.com. We're talking about some of the style of the Look at American films. And this is kind of interesting considering they were made for a very, very select audience, but they used a lot of sensibilities of from people such as John Ford. Yes, and John Ford actually directed some of their films. And every now and then, uh, Look at Mountain would call a producer up the hill, up the, up the Royal Canyon from one of the studios to just produce uh, an introduction to a film. There's a sense there that as early as that Operation Ivy film, Lookout Mountain understood that the style could help tell the story Mm -hmm. when the story itself is a story that's so new to tell about how to to talk about the scale of change in the world's uh, global political relations, the scale of change in our technical capacity and our capacity for destruction. There had to be a style uh, to help tell that story. And so you see even playing out across their documents of the nuclear tests in the desert, you see a a lot of overlap with the Westerns at the time uh, through the kind of music and titles you see, uh, all all manner of things. So so the the Hollywood style, the cinematic style, is a big part of the the story of Lookout Mountain. And one of the groups watching these films uh, were were soldiers. And, uh, you know, what were they watching on Friday night? (laughs) Um, They were watching Hollywood Westerns. Yeah. So um, for them to uh, show up to a briefing and be shown a film about uh, an operation that they're going to participate in, a a nuclear testing operation out in the Nevada desert, and for it to look and feel and sound like a a Hollywood film um, makes a lot of sense, right? This is a way of sort of connecting to these these guys, uh, many of whom were... You know, we know we're very, very worried about participating in these tests. Um, uh, there was a lot of misinformation about, and there was a lot of accurate information about, <laughs> all of which uh, made them scared, right? And so uh, part of Lookout Mountain's job was to try to calm them down and prepare them for the work that they were going to do. Another technique that Lookout Mountain Lab used 
to reach its audience, select though it was, was animation. In fact, I understand it had a very large animation department. How did Lookout Mountain use animation in its films? One of the interesting things about the prominence of animation there is that it's actually the most visible part of the studio's structure. If, you've, if you look at pictures of Lookout Mountain Laboratory, which still exists, has a facility up in Little Canyon, you'll see a kind of uh, uh, a tower at the top with, with lots of glass that people have thought was a lookout tower of some kind, but in fact it was the animation studio. They built a whole new floor of the facility just for their animation crew. And the animators were called in to create really compelling visualizations of all the stuff that was hard to actually get on film. What happens actually inside an atomic uh, reaction? Uh, what happens uh, with the, the radiation that's uh, pelting the bottom of a bomber? Uh, all these things needed to be illustrated in other forms, and the, the animators are just master uh, craftsmen at what they do. These are animators that were hired away from Disney. These were the animators that worked on Fantasia, and Bambi, and Dumbo, creating, in some ways, some very beautiful, uh, abstract, even, imagery of what was happening in, in these sort of sub-visible phenomenon. Yeah, and Walt Disney himself was in direct relationship with the studio uh, when there was a fire at the studio that forced some of the animators out for a period of time. Uh, he welcomed them over uh, to his facilities, and uh, and they sort of worked over there for a period of time. And so uh, there was a there was a lot of back and forth between Disney and Lookout Mountain in the 1950s. Lookout Mountain Laboratory disbanded in 1969. Without giving away too much of the backstory, what was the reason for that? There's a lot of reasons in play there, Ed. Uh, you could start with something as basic as the wave of base closures that Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara initiated uh, many years before. And Lookout Mountain Laboratory, as a, as a mere facility, was slated for closure. But also... As in a lot of things in the military, there's always this question about should certain services be provided centrally or should they be provided in some sort of uh, distributed way. And the story of Lookout Mountain's closure is in part a story of centralizing certain photographic services in a larger uh, unit that actually moved, moved out to San Bernardino. Uh, also, this is, could be the story of the rise of video. And if you think about film as a very specialized technique uh, requiring a lot of specialized equipment, with video on the rise, certainly uh, in the 70s, you've got uh, the, the power of making images more in the hands of just about anybody eventually, and I think that also plays a role. The other part, there's two other sort of elements here. One is that there, it, in some ways their closure was a, a mark of their success. They were so good at what they did <laughs> that the Air Force wanted to build even a bigger facility, and that's what they did at Norton Air Force Base in San Bernardino, as Kevin was suggesting, and that was about, you know, doing even bigger and better. Um, there was also a real change, as your listeners know, in the political tone in Hollywood during the 1960s, mm -hmm. and that was partly, you know, in the 50s, Lookout Mountain Laboratory was able to get along quite well with many in Hollywood, and uh, there were many in Hollywood who were supportive of what they were doing. In the 1960s, especially around the Vietnam War, that really started to change. Lookout Mountain itself was heavily involved in the Vietnam War in terms of photographic responsibilities, uh, and so the political tenor was changing there in Hollywood. Um, it was also just really practical things, like uh, actors in Hollywood in the 1960s wanted to grow their hair long, yeah. because that's what, <laughs> what, 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 what directors wanted, right? Yeah. And, and if you're going to appear in an Air Force uh, film, even in the 1960s, you've got to have your hair short. Yeah. And so they were just, they were having problems recruiting uh, actors who were willing to cut their hair. So there were just various kinds of points of friction that emerged in, in Hollywood in the 1960s for Lookout Mountain. And, uh, and that was just yet another reason for them to close shop. Is there anything else about Lookout America, the book, that I have not asked you that you want our listeners to know about? You know, one thing that comes to mind, Ed, is that we were surprised to learn just how big a role Lookout Mountain played in coverage of um, war and conflicts more broadly in Southeast Asia. And as many of your listeners are probably aware and remember, Vietnam War became a television war yeah. through the nightly footage that was 
uh, often shared of, of dog fights in the air or even footage of, of napalm runs that began to be a real subject of focus and anxiety for the nation. That that footage also was shot by Lookout Mountain really blew me away. I was so surprised to learn that that too uh, came from this outfit. They they could barely they really could barely keep up. They couldn't really keep up with the demand of uh, of the the new role of film uh, in in war that happened in Vietnam. And in some ways, that was a precursor uh, to what we would end up seeing in the wars in Iraq as well, with with imagery being so prominent as part of uh, aerial combat. And the studio was also documenting, as we talked about earlier, the missile race, and that that uh, ended up being um, a, a huge undertaking for them, and and that included stuff with NASA as well. And so, um, again, if we start to think about where your listeners might have already seen um, Lookout Mountain. Uh, uh, images and uh, footage apart from our website. They, I'm sure they have. They've all seen it. Yeah. Um, they've seen it in these these iconic images of, of astronauts and of space monkeys and of rocket launches and of you know uh, bombing raids in Vietnam and uh, you know not to mention nuclear mushroom clouds. And so they really. They were everywhere <laughs> that the United States was, the United States military was in the Cold War, um, getting the stuff on on film, and uh, left us an incredible visual legacy. And if you pick up a copy of Look at America, folks, you'll get an idea of that incredible visual legacy. It is a gorgeously, gorgeously, gorgeously put together book. It has the shape of a coffee table book. It is filled with full double-page spreads, full-color photographs, lots of graphics, lots of charts, lots of screen grabs of the film that accompany all the information, all the copiously researched chapters that uh, Ned and Kevin put together. Look at America, the secret Hollywood studio at the heart of the Cold War, available at your local bookseller. You can also find it at Amazon.com, wherever books are sold online. Kevin Hamilton, Ned O'Gorman, thank you so much for joining us, and all the best of luck with your book. Thank you, Ed. It's really good to talk with you and your listeners. Yeah, it's been, this has really been a treat, so thank you so much, Ed, for having us on. Torchy Smith will join us when we come back on TV Con. Financial. Got a product or service that you want our listeners to know about? Become an advertiser or underwriter of TV Confidential and let our brand help promote your brand. For more information, go to televisionconfidential.com forward slash advertise or visit the TV Confidential page at advertisecast.com. Ed Robertson along with Tony Figaro and Donna Allen from Story Salon, Southern California's longest running regularly performing live storytelling ensemble, which I understand is in a new location. Yeah, we're very excited about it. We're moving, actually, to the Party Art Studio on Laurel Canyon Boulevard, 5302 Laurel Canyon. It's a new art gallery, and it's, it's beautiful. Gonna, it's beautiful. Don and I have been involved with Story Salon for the last nine-plus years. We're going to be in an art gallery now. We're going to have a $5 cover, some nice refreshments, and a wonderful, eclectic evening of storytelling. Which is a great environment because, it, 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 as you say, the word is eclectic, and for $5, it's a great evening of entertainment you can't ask for much more no not at all and uh, these stories some of them are funny some of them are tragic some of them are a little off the wall but we just have a wonderful time uh, keeping the art of storytelling alive and you can find out more about it by going to storysalon.com accredited by guinness world records welcome to archival television audio incorporated a peerless TV soundtrack archive, preserving the audio from television's first three decades, the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, the golden and silver age of television. For more information, go to atvaudio.com. We're Biffle and Schuster. How do you do? We turned up here to spread some cheer and entertain you. That's right. We're Biffle and Schuster. I'm Benny Biffle, and this is Sammy Schuster. And we're here to tell you about this amazing DVD, not BVD, DVD that just came out from a company called Kino Lorber. And you know what Kino Lorber means, don't you, Sammy? I sure do. It means sales. <laughs> Lots of sales. This collection is called The Misadventures of... Biffle and Schuster. That's right. 
Mm-hmm. Those guys it's terrific. Good. Yeah, you know what uh, Joe Dante says about them? What did he say? He says, forehead slapping funny. What impresses is the dogged authenticity to the era, which makes it all the more hilarious. Absolutely. Accent on the high. Where Biffle, Biffle and Schuster, as, as you can see, see no, no one, one else can make, make that statement louder than we. They say we're soporific and it's probably we. Because we're Biffle and Schuster. Oh, we're Biffle and Schuster. No, no. We're Biffle and Schuster. B-I-F-F-L-Biffle. Biffle. S-H-W-O-S to Schuster. Biffle and Schuster. Need we say more? Available wherever DVDs are sold through our friends at Kino Lorber. All right, you loafers, get back to work. What am I paying you for? Why is he yelling at his shoes?